So about a month ago, Alan Cross had, uh, a, I think, a two-part series on tickets uh, on on his podcast, ongoing ongoing history of new music. Uh, you remember that? You did you you heard those episodes? I think right. Uh, I heard one of them. Yeah. And so I believe they were both. Maybe they were only in one, but they had sample commercials of rock concerts was that in your in the episode that you listened to do you do you recall him playing because usually he'll play music um and and maybe he did i think so yeah but but he also played commercials uh promoting rock concerts Mm -hmm. so greg i thought what I could do on this episode is in the voice of those announcers, promo a festival that is coming up. Uh, Uh, So, so let's, I'm just kidding. I'm a a little, I'm a little slow today. That's, That's okay. You're in the hammer. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can do this. Coming this fall. To the Highland Festival grounds at the Kentucky Expo Center. Louder than live. Featuring Green Day, Queens of the Stone Age, Pantera, Avenged Sevenfold, Gobsmack, Limp Biscuit, Tool, Rancid, Weezer, and coming back to the stage, Foo Fighters. That's September 21st to the 24th, Kentucky Expo Center, Louder Than Life. Life, life. Get your tickets now at louderthanlifefestival.com. What do you you think? Was that all right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think I think I think I think I might have fun with that post. That was good. Thank that you. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I might I might take voiceover classes and Oh yeah. I, I, there might there might be a, a gig for me there. There might be. Yeah. Might is probably the operative word. Might, yes. <laughs> yes. Today we have John Bora coming on to the podcast. We do. He has worked with so many people. He probably knows everyone that's been on our podcast. There are a lot of people yeah. that have been on our podcast. Yes. That John has played with over the years. Yes. 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 And I'm looking forward to chatting with him about it. Yeah. A number of them. Yeah. So we'll get to that. But uh, yeah, check out, seriously, check out Louder Than Life Festival. Dot com. Go check out our website at welcome to the music.com. Keep on top of our socials. You can uh, find us on Instagram. Don't ask me what the handle is, but we're there. Let me check what the handle is. Welcome music pod. Is it welcome music pod? Let's let's double check what this is. As you can tell, we are. What is uh, it? What is it on Twitter? What? I don't know what it's on Twitter. Welcome to the music pod on Instagram. That's what I just said. You said welcome music pod. Oh, that's right. That was yeah. probably our Twitter handle. <laughs> that was that was before that was before our Twitter handle was marked as government funded. Yes. Media. Yes. And so and so we've we've stopped twittering. We stopped twittering because yeah. we were noted as government funded. No, because and we're, and Pro- we're not propaganda. We're, we're we're funded by four taxpayers. <laughs> Our wives, who are are the other two, <laughs> not 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 on the screen with us. Yes, <laughs> yes. We're funded by four taxpayers. Yep. And uh, so we're we're uh, we are boycotting uh, Twitter. Which is which is quite unfortunate because uh, at one point in time, I think for you as well, 
probably the best social media app um, that I've ever used. You know, it's 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 my first love, and I'll never forget my first love. So there is that. <laughs> Louder than life festival. Check it out. Louder than life festival. Dot com. Hi, the following podcast is brought to you by Radical Road Brewery, the best craft beer in the heart of Leslieville. Find them at 1177 Queen Street East. That's Radical Road Brewery. Hello, my name is John Bora from Toronto, Ontario. I'm a singer, songwriter, musician, and uh, welcome to the music. Welcome, 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 uh, John. It's it's a pleasure to have you join us today. It's an honor for have you join us today. Um, I want to start off with, and it was my wife that actually mentioned. She, my wife's seen you numerous times at various festivals, and uh, she talked about you being sort of one of the the OG and an important people in the you know the the busking community within you know particularly playing in the TTC. Um, or play playing, you know, in, um, at the TTC, and I've read a few things about that. Can you talk about sort of the 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 importance of of busking, and you know how you were involved in like, you know, yeah, promoting yeah, it? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, um, yeah, the first time I don't do that anymore. Uh, no, um, no. But uh, I mean, it did serve me well for many years. Uh, I started out basically just. Uh, you know, uh, you know, being in my apartment, sort of broke between gigs and stuff like that, thinking I'm sitting here playing my guitar or whatever inside, and why don't I, if I did it outside, maybe I could at least make some money, and and then that led to, uh, you know, trying to do it a little more seriously. I mean, you really have to find your kind of niche and 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 where to play, um, like especially if you're you're doing it outside. I mean, not every street is a good street or maybe good for you in what you're doing whether you have a little ensemble or some people do well down by the sky dome other people mm -hmm. do well the yorkville or whatnot so um and then um and then uh you know but uh, playing so, so yeah it was just always a way to kind of like uh, augment my income and uh you know also get some more playing time in and practicing especially when i started singing and and uh you know writing songs uh lyrical songs i should say mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, it was just, a, you know, I, I was always learning a bunch of songs anyway, you know, by other people uh, as a way to sort of get inside them and try to see how the sort of different way, ways people write songs. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I guess when you're playing outside, you're limited by the weather. Uh, you know, you can only play between certain uh, months of the year. And then there's also, uh, you know, the, you could have Friday night all scheduled that, OK, I'm going to go out on Friday night. I'm going to make some money and it's pouring rain or, or you show up to your favorite spot and there's either someone else there or someone panhandling there or whatever. So I thought I would try it and, and uh, get into the TTC and mm -hmm. um, which is something you audition for once a year. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it's something you can do year round because it's indoors and you have a certain amount of rights and, uh, you know, the sound is good in some of those uh hallways and whatnot and and then that that did serve me well for for uh, several years but that did start to feel like for me personally a bit of a dead end job you know because my, mm. my my real goal was to, yeah, i was basically do that for money but you know my 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 uh, overreaching goal was to be you know write songs and 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 you know you know make a living playing my own songs whereas mm -hmm. the subway so i i sort of made a conscious decision to to stop doing it a bit of the luster had worn off of it there's a lot of insecurity that goes with it you know you can yeah all the all the uh, i don't mean personal insecurities i mean like un, uh, um like um like again it's friday afternoon you got your favorite spot you know everything you know should say that you're gonna have a great day and then for some reason the money's just not coming in mm. and, and so there's always that unknown factor and um and you know it's it's it it can be a bit thankless at times, right? You're gonna put up with a bunch of it. Could there could be? I've had some of the most beautiful experiences 
you know, just playing for the the, the general public in, in, in that situation. And I've had some of my most frustrating and, and sort of depressing oh. sort of experiences being out there too. So yeah, hmm. I can imagine. Was was that you know, like comedians will do open mics to 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 get started, or um, was was that was that some of your first performances live? Was busking? No, no, no. I started playing in bands when I was like fifteen. Yeah. Uh, I think my first bar gig was just before, just after my sixteenth birthday, and uh, you know, it was really when I started, um, uh, uh, you know, writing lyrical songs. I'd actually, I'd been, uh, my friend Frank Nevada and I went to uh, Europe in 1991 with the idea of playing on the streets. And, and I actually brought a, a little hand drum with me to play. Hmm. I wasn't singing or, or playing guitar. And, uh, you know, we went over to Europe. We thought it would be a way to to, 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 to see um, to see the world and, um, you know, make some money at, you know, be able to pay for a longer trip. And, uh, and you know, we'd heard that uh, the people in Europe were, um, um, you know, uh, didn't treat buskers like beggars. They treated them like artists, and and that was true. We we you know uh, I, I, we made you know I made a living from music for the first time in my life, and wow. we had this uh, we had this wonderful summer, um, you know, playing on the streets of Europe and in bars and parties and everything. And but that you know I, we were playing all cover songs and everything, and that sort of you know I just sort of that that sort of became you know I, I i longed to get back to to toronto and, and start playing in some original bands again so that's what i did but when i got back i started you know learning a bunch of songs and i decided that i was going to try try to write my own lyrical songs for the first time and um and then yeah so it was just sort of a natural extension of that but when i played on the street i would never really or in the subways i never did my own songs i would always just do oh. other songs. yeah yeah hmm. what what songs greg sorry greg you you, you sent us down this no i was i was gonna say oh, and, and, and <laughs> yeah no it died from the busking side just more like uh, you mentioned about your first gig at 16. i, I, I want to know like again we'll probably get into you know you know your inspiration past and getting into music but where was your first gig at 16. i was at a, a bar called the turning point on blur street it was a punk rock mm. dive bar and <clears throat> yeah it was either just before or just after my 16th birthday. And um, yeah, I was still in, in high school. I was in grade 10, you know, had a band and we went down and played with this other band who was, uh, you know, went to the school, high school next to us. There was, there was only like, you know, one punk band per, per school <laughs> at that time. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was great. It was, it was, you know, I mean, it wasn't like I playing an all ages show. It was, you know, somehow a bunch of yep. teenage kids passing for being 19 i mean i got served that night i was gonna ask and, you <laughs> and uh, yeah i don't think they were too big on the rules at that place Back but, then, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah that's yeah that's the, one of the funny things I, I was asking too is because one of my first my, certainly my first toronto gig um, around the same age uh and and believe me the music if I told you the music we played, what the, my my first gig had no street cred, but was Lee, Larry's Hideaway. And yeah, it was like, and I was like around the same age, maybe sixteen, maybe early seventeen, and it was just like, you know, I grew up out in Durham, so it was like, you know, just a deer in the headlights playing right. your first gig, you know, first strong gig at a place like well, that. that. Yeah, that's so, that's yeah. pretty good. I, you know, I I felt like uh, when I first played Larry's that I, that I would, uh, you know, I'd sort of. You know, not hit the big time, but it was definitely a step <laughs> up from some of the uh, other clubs that we'd been playing. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, great bands would, would play there, right? Like, uh, yeah. you know, I saw Nick Cave there and, you know, uh, all sorts of, you know, Gary's presented shows would, would happen uh, there right away. So it felt like kind of like a more professional stage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny because we were just, we were honestly, we were like, we were new romantic, new wave. So we, that's why I'm saying there's no, I can't give myself any street cred for playing Larry's Hideaway from the perspective of the punk movement. We were like, we were drum yeah. machine and then probably several of made jackets or something. So. Yeah, yeah, well, whatever. I mean, it's all, it all feels silly <laughs> now to think about this. But all that was still considered new wave. It wasn't, yeah. uh, you know, doing, a, you know, Zeppelin covers or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Never cooler enough. than that, right? <laughs> <Not fair laughs> At the time. How did you get started, John, in, in music? Do you remember the first instrument that that you played did your parents send you for like piano lessons how did you get your uh guitar was the first story? thing yeah i know i always loved music always always loved rock and roll and um 
pretty much from as, as long as I can, uh, you know, as early as I can remember. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to start playing guitar. So my parents bought me an acoustic guitar and put me in uh, hmm. uh, uh, guitar lessons. I was in group lessons. It was uh, in this community center in Mississauga. And, um, you know, there's, I don't know, 20 people, two students in the class doing, you know, Mel Bay's uh, book number one or, you know, <laughs> whatever, grade one guitar. And um, <clears throat> at the end, uh, there was a test. And uh, I've never been good at, I've, I think I have what they call ADHD or, so, you know, they, they didn't have a name for it when I was growing up. It's just uh, John mm -hmm. doesn't pay attention. Uh, <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> I don't know. The whole scholastic thing was something I never really jived with uh, in, in that sort of, th those type of settings. Yeah. And uh, I remember I got 29% on my test. <laughs> And uh, and the teacher said to my my dad, he said, "Listen, you know, I I, I can't really you know put him into grade two because uh, he failed grade one so miserably. But uh, I teach private lessons, so if you want to start uh, bringing him over to my place, uh, you oh, know, sure. I'll teach him more like what he wants to learn." And so so I started, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, going to take guitar lessons from this guy named uh, Brian James. And, nice. Yeah. And in terms and of then, inspiration, like rock and roll, what what. Uh... What sort of bands were you listening to back then? Um, you know, I liked, uh, you know, Alice Cooper, uh, Kiss, Selvin John, oh, Led wow. Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, you know, all that sort of like 70s rock, the Stones and, you know, all that 70s rock and roll or rock, I guess. And then your first band? First band was in high school uh, when I was in grade 10, uh, at the beginning of grade 10. And we, we that, that was when I first sort of got really turned on to, uh, um, although I, I sort of, I've been aware, aware of the, the new music, uh, you know, punk and stuff that had been coming out, but I hadn't quite really uh, sort of embraced it. And um, these two guys that were o older than me um, came up to me once and they said, hey, we hear you play guitar. And I was like, yeah. And they said, well, we're starting a band. You want to join our band? And I, was, I thought, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and they gave me uh, some Ramones records and 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 stuff like that. I said, "This is the stuff we want to play." And I thought, "Okay, cool." And uh, so, so it was a cover band. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what was the yeah, name of the band? Do you remember? It was called. Uh, I think we started out as uh, the Rogues, and then it got turned into Blind Impulse or something like that. <laughs> Both pretty terrible names, but um, I the like singer Rogues. Rogues sounds pretty cool. <laughs> But the, yeah, we did like Ramones, Teenage Head, um, you know, all that that kind of you know early punk stuff. Yeah, and was that the band that you played with uh, at the Turning Point? It was, yes. Yeah. Okay. So how like how long were you were you guys together, and when did you start uh, playing or, or writing original original songs? Uh, okay, so um, I was with that group only lasted pretty much, I guess, the year that I was in grade 10. No one else in the band really had any uh, aspirations to do, you know, like uh, the, the drummer went on to be a, you know, football star. And um, <clears throat> so I guess, and uh, yeah, I guess we only played together sort of for, for the, that school year, maybe, and into the summer. There was a band that lived in my neighborhood. I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto and, and there was a, there was a group that had, uh, they'd all been kicked out of their, parents house they'd gone to the the neighboring high school and they were living in this house uh near where where uh it, you know okay closer to the, the school that i was going to and uh they would have these parties and it was you know all the jocks and everything would would would, would go there they called it the punker house right it was this yeah. bizarre place where you know there was people are you know uh, you know in their in their te teenage people living in a house with no parents and and having these parties with a band playing and um, that band that I had been in, um, you know, we did, we played at one of their parties and then, uh, and then they, they were looking for, they needed a bass player. And um, um, they asked me if I wanted to play bass and, you know, my buddy Kenny was playing drums with them and um, yeah, they were the first people I'd ever met that um, wanted to do music as a career, you know, as a living, as something, you know, not just as a, a hobby. And uh, that's, when it sort of hit me that, um, wow, that maybe I could do this. Maybe this is something that I could actually do for, uh, yeah. you know, my job. Did you, did you play bass before or? No, I, I played, I was playing guitar before. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. 
I was just intrigued by the by the offer, and you know, I wanted to play with. And like I say, they they inspired me to. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I'd never really considered. Like at that time, uh, you know, it seemed like you had to be so good to be a professional musician. I mean, I grew up I grew up in the seventies, where you know, people were writing operas, and and you know, every, everyone had this great technical proficiency, and that that was never me. I mean, I just I really loved it, and I could bash out some chords and. And um, punk sort of opened that up that like, mm -hmm. you know, that's all you need really is the mainly the love of doing it, the, the desire to do it, uh, work hard at it. And and um, so, yeah, it seemed like a, an, 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 uh, you know, an opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What was was there a I'm, I'm curious, John, was there a, a punk scene? as you were getting started or was, or, or were you part of that, um, part of that group that, that, I don't know, brought punk to yeah. Toronto? Well, in, in Mississauga. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was definitely a punk scene in Toronto. We're talking about the early eighties for me, like 81, I guess. Um, when I first started playing in that band, yeah, my, my, my high school band. So, I mean, punk was already a thing. But it hadn't really reached the suburbs. Like, uh, I mean, there was like a, there would be a few people at each school, right? You know, like we were the four people at our school, and uh, and then you know, the the kids the kids who had this 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 house. I mean, there 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 was more of a scene at that school, but no, it was very minimal back then. And yeah, I was definitely one of the first in, in my school to be listening to that. Can you um? Can you? One of the questions I'd love to explore with you, and I know you. have there's a video from CIUT that I, I saw. Um, I think with the vile tones was that yeah yeah that right from the CIUT. CI um, yeah. Can you talk about the importance of CIUT CKLN and in a way the spirit of the radio back in the day in terms of you know oh yeah support? yeah well um, as I'm sure you can remember there weren't very many avenues to find uh, you know this was the music was all very underground you know that term alternative I mean it really meant it was an alter. Everything was an alternative to the mainstream, right? You couldn't, uh, you know, you had to go to find special record shops to find the records you were looking for. You know, like the record, the record peddler, records on wheels. Uh, um, you had to, you know, look in special magazines that would be writing about the bands that you're interested in. And there were very few um, radio outlets. That, you know, um, in Toronto, there was uh, CKLN. C uh, I U T came along a little later. I think they started in eighty six or eighty seven, mm -hmm. and uh, and then there was of course Brave New Waves, which was a CBC show that ran from midnight till six in the morning, and uh, that was a lifeline. You know, I remember. Wow. Uh, I, I mean, uh, so, you know, um, you know, lying in bed while still living at home, and uh, you know, in, in the in the you know the the very plain Jane suburbs, you know, you know, getting uh, all this cool music from from England and the States and, and hearing about all this, this cool stuff. And also local, mm -hmm. local bands. I mean, the first time I ever heard, uh, uh, well, not the first time, but you know, you'd hear, uh, you know, vital signs and Stern group mm -hmm. and, uh, rent boys and, you know, some of these, these bands that were, you know, uh, playing, you know, just local bands playing in bars. And, um, so, uh, yeah, see, I mean, CIUT, uh, sorry, CKLN was the first station that ever uh, played some music that I was in. Uh, it was a band called Neon Rome, which uh, was from 84 mm -hmm. to 89. That was the first band that I was in that ever made a record. And in fact, they, they started playing, uh, we had a tape, we opened for the Jesus and Mary Chain at wow. uh, RPM. And it was their first, in 1985, it was their first, um, their first North American tour, definitely their first Canadian date. And um, I don't even think they had a full length record out. I think they only had a couple singles out at that point. And uh, our, our sound person, uh, Mike Dent, uh, made a recording. I mean, RPM was a bigger, it, it later went on to become the government. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that big building down uh, on Queens Key there. Um, and at the time, it was a gigantic uh, sort of New York style dance club. It was heavily decorated. They would have a theme, like I had a JFK theme. They literally had a, a a Cadillac hanging from the ceiling with a with the you know him being shot. That you know whatever oh go go goodness. pages and mm -hmm. it's just a, one of those enormous like uh, New York style nightclubs. But they would also have the Garys would put on shows there. And Elliot Lefko had a had a night called Independent Wednesdays that was a showcase yep. for independent bands. And um, so. Uh, 
yeah, our first Gary show was was opening for the Jesus Mary Chain. Our, our sound person, uh, Mike Dent, he made a, a, a board recording. And, and one of those songs from that board recording somehow ended up at CKLN and they started playing it. And it was getting played on the radio and then it was actually on the charts. On a uh, Nerve magazine had a uh, had a had a, it had a CKLN chart, so yeah, it was it was great. I got it, you know. And the, my first interview on the radio, I was I was working uh, uh, at Eaton's at the time, and I actually convinced my boss that um, and, you know, I had to, he had to let me go for the afternoon because uh, because it was so important. This is so important that I didn't want to miss this radio interview because I'd never been on the radio before, and you know, it sort of seems silly now, but. I, I must have made a good enough case because he let me go, and uh, so so it's vitally important, vitally important. Um, you know, that's uh, they uh, CKLN used to um, um, you know present some shows from Neon Rome. Neon Rome is a band that I was in that first started you know like made a record, first started making any sort of noise in terms of you know generating a decent following mm -hmm. and and you know sort of known and respect by our peers. And uh, CKLN would present some of our shows, which meant they would do a little commercial for you. And, you know, August 12th, uh, go see a Neon Rome at, uh, at Larry's Hideaway or whatever. And then uh, CIUT, um, you know, or, you know, is still going strong today. Uh, I just I was just on a, a David James show last week. And, um, you know, I listen to C CIUT every week. There's some great shows on there that I still, uh, you know, I love to listen to. You know, one of the last places where... DJs get to program their own music, yes. pick their own stuff, and you know they got some great. Uh, there's some great shows on CIUT. And, uh, wow! Yeah, yeah, Monday from twelve till uh, twelve to two is uh, Steve Fruitman's got a show called Thirty Three Forty Five Seventy Eight. Uh, the next uh, Tuesday from twelve to two um, uh, is a Doctor Month. Doctor Mouth's uh, Rock and Roll Lunchbox is just both two amazing, just phenomenal uh djs they both like play a really eclectic mix uh, of stuff and they're, they're they, they clearly love what they're playing there's always a lot yeah. of background information and uh, yeah so oh that's amazing that that's I, still going mm -hmm. on okay yeah yeah that is yeah. perfect I, I was gonna ask you you know the ways that you know greg greg and i talk about you know what we used to listen to and he would you know, talk about all of these radio shows that he would listen to on uh, The Edge, CFNY, Spirit of Radio. Um, and, you know, I never had that upbringing myself, but I, I would hear friends talk about staying up late night and listening to to the radio and, and discovering, discovering, like, quote, unquote, new music, discovering bands from England or the States or wherever the case may be. Um and it's obviously changed nowadays, right? Where people are listening to um, Spotify playlists um, and mm -hmm. not so much discovering new music, but um, listening to to songs that they're familiar with. Uh, yeah, or, I, I, I would I would argue though people are discovering music through some of those platforms. I, I think so. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't use the Spotify myself, um, but uh, yeah, I imagine the algorithms are always suggesting things, new things for you. So I do imagine there's a certain element of discovery there for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean, you're not discovering music that you'll you'll never, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like if you listen to hard rock, you're going to discover hard rock, right? No. Right. Well, I mean, the algorithms are there to, yeah. to sort of feed you new stuff, but I think the difference is that everything is available to everybody. Now, That's right. As back then, you had to kind of go to that special record shop or, or yeah. tune into that um, radio station or radio show that uh, that would be uh, you know playing the you know you know the the DJ would be playing stuff that uh, you know along the lines of what you'd be into, and so it was sort of curated to a certain degree. Yeah, and it's amazing. And, and you couldn't just get that everywhere. You couldn't get it yeah. everywhere or anywhere. It had to be mm -hmm. specific kind of places. Yeah, it's great Whereas to now, hear. Sorry. That you're discovering music, you know, still through some of these radio stations. Yeah. That uh, that you know, when we were kids, when we were you know youth, we we would a, lo a lot of our peers and us would would go to the the station and and listen to what's what's up and coming. Yeah. And uh, and 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 what's new. Um, 
I think the whole menu thing kind of bugs me. Like the whole, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, you know, you used to channel surf and, you know, you'd sort of come across a show that, that, that yes. was interesting. I wasn't really looking for a documentary on um, whatever sea turtles, but this looks interesting. <laughs> and, uh, whereas now you have to sort of, you have to make that choice before, right? Like, it's all based on these menus and, and, you know, I find the Netflix things very, uh, I'm, a, I'm kind of old fashioned, I guess you could tell, but I do find it a bit of a disconnect, but you know, you have to sort of, you have to go to it and choose it. You get, you, you know, and yeah, it's like just flipping through your record collection and then, Oh, something catches your eye. And so you put it on. I, I look at this, I have this little player that I use when I'm doing sound. And sometimes I just look at it and I'm like, ah, there's thousands of songs on here. But if, if I'm not thinking, you know, you just can't, it's, it's not that, uh, um, User friendly to just scroll through and just you know let something pop out. I have to sort of think about it first, decide what I want, and then use the menu to go and, and select that. Or as, uh, I don't. There was something to be said about you know knowing that you know on a Thursday or Friday a, a record would drop, and right. you know whether you're in Mississauga or Durham or Scarborough, uh, you'd have to hop on public transit or get a ride from maybe mom or dad. And, and make the trek down to uh, Sam the Record Man or, you know, or a place like that. And and sometimes you'd, you'd line up, other times you'd get in and you're rifling through um, and you'd ask the cool kids behind the counter, you know, what's what's the next, what's the cool thing I should listen to? Um, right. Or even concerts, lining up to buy tickets yeah. at concerts, right? There was, there seemed to be an effort and I think that effort translated if i'm going to make this investment of time to go and get this uh um, and money yeah and money yeah. when you're buying a record right yeah i'm, I'm going to you know it, there was something about that but now it's yeah. like a you know a couple of clicks and you know all of the music ever recorded is at your fingertips it seems that yeah. you know we listen to music now and it's in the background you know it's not we're not sitting we're not i remember reading even on, on CD inserts, you know, reading all the lyrics as the song would play, you know, um, nowadays, yeah. you know, a lot of us don't spend a lot of time really sitting and, and listening to, to music. Yeah. Well, I agree. I agree. You know, when I was young, I'm like, what did you do last night? Oh, I went over to so-and-so's place. We sat around, you know, smoked a couple of reefers, listened to some records. Yeah. That was it. Right? Yeah. it wasn't like we had five other things going on and music <laughs> playing in the background. And music was in the background. You know? Yeah, you know, yeah. What I mean, it is the times. I don't mind to sound like a complete uh, you know, um, you know, old person <laughs> what it is, but uh, you know, I think there was something to well, you know, that investment that you're talking about. You go to a record store and you're deciding between this record and that record. Yeah. And you decide that you're gonna plunk your your six or eight dollars down on, you know, choice number A. And you get it home and you put it on and it doesn't blow you away right away. And you're like, oh, maybe I should have got the other one. Well, that you, you, you've you just spent, you know, eight of your hard earned dollars to buy that record. God damn it. You're going to play it more than once. Right. Yeah. And then sometimes, sometimes some of my favorite records, you know, you know, it wasn't until like the third or fourth listen that it really, really grabbed me. And then, you know, I would listen to it every day for a year. Yeah. And, um, yeah. You know, but if, uh, you know, with, 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 uh, if, if I hadn't made that investment, plus you could only listen to what you had on your person, like in your house. You didn't have, you know, now people rent, um, you know, uh, access to basically a library that has everything in it. Whereas, you know, you could only choose from the records that you had in your collection. Or That's if you true. Go to a friend's place, you could only choose from the records that they have in their collection. And, and so maybe you gave those... Maybe you listen to them more and and uh, each each record more and, and became more um, you know uh, you know it was a much more deeper sort of experience and got yeah. to know the records a lot better. That's true. Uh, listen, I'd be remiss if I didn't. Uh, I know it's it's uh, it happened in in Q four of last year October. You you released two uh, two new uh, uh, out. Well, one is I guess a re release. Yeah, uh, and another was a release. So cassettes in common, yeah, uh, came out. So congrats on that. And then you also uh, re-released. Um, was, was it your first? first? Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so Cassettes in Common is a record that I put out in the fall. It's a covers record. Yeah. It's all songs by people that I know or have known. Um, you know, there's uh, like uh, Bob Snyder, Keith Whitaker from the Demix, uh, you know, uh, Frank Nevada, Ron Sexsmith, Art Bergman, Kip Harness, just, just all songs by people I know. Uh, a lot of people aren't very well known or, or you know, some of these songs sure. had a brief release in, in uh, or a small release many, many years ago. And uh, I realized that the, the through line for that was that a lot of these songs either first came out on a cassette or I first oh. heard them on a cassette. So, um, so that's why I called it Cassettes in Common. Yeah. And then um, my first record, my first solo record only ever came out in cassette. It never uh, had okay. a digital release. So I thought uh, it would be a good uh, you know, opportunity to finally digitize that. And, uh, you know, it sort of had a, a bit of, it was also the 25th anniversary, I guess, since it had been 25 years since oh, I put it out. Wow. So it just seemed like a good excuse to to sort of finally issue that uh, in digital form. Yeah. So. Hmm. so so the Cassettes in Common album, um, did you set out intending to do a cover, a cover album? Like, how did that come come to be? Uh, well, <clears throat> it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. Some of these songs uh, I've been doing for a long time. There's a song by uh, a guy named Sandy Filto, who used to have a, a group called The Hacks, which uh, only ever put out one cassette, which was in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, we've been doing, uh, in my, put my band, uh, my John Bora band together in 97, right, right around the time that my first tape came out. And, you know, we I've been playing one of his songs, a song called Sunken Glue. Ever since, uh, there's, uh, you know, a Bob Snyder song that I've always done. Um, you know, there's some just other songs by people that I've always thought were great songs and, and yeah. should be recorded, like a song by my friend Frank Nevada. And, um, yeah, so it's uh, something that I've always wanted to do. And um, I guess the pandemic seemed like a good time to do it, right? I, I, put, my, I put out a, a record of original music in 2020 just before the pandemic hit. Mm. and um <clears throat> yeah i don't know about you guys but i don't know i just wasn't feeling super i you know i wasn't sitting around in the pandemic writing tons of songs i tell you you know it was a bit of a i wasn't super inspired I was sitting around looking at my walls of my apartment for for, for ever so i thought uh maybe it would be a good time to record some of these songs i, yeah. I originally thought it would be just sort of an ep but you know next thing you know i had uh, 10 songs and it was a full-length record so nice mm. yeah. um so a, a, a few guests that that that, uh, that show yeah. up on this album, uh, whether you recorded their songs or people that you played with, um, so Ron Sexsmith, Art Bergman, both of them have been on uh, this show, and then uh, Mike uh, Boguski. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. from um, Barney Bentall. I know yeah. you played. I played one of. Sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, um, <clears throat> well, Michael Boguski plays piano. He plays in my band. Yeah, yeah. So that's why he's he's on all, all the tracks. He plays piano and uh, accordion or organ in my band and has for um, uh, many, many years. Um, Barney Bentall, um, he's not on this record, but I did, I played bass no. on a couple, uh, yeah. on one of his records on a couple songs, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like how how like it's it's fascinating when I see these names of people that you've you've played with uh, songs that you've covered of theirs. Um, I, I guess the question I want to ask is, um, you know, whether you are, you know, working with people like Mike and Barney, um, or covering songs from from Art and Ron. Um, what what is what is that sort of camaraderie uh, of of singer songwriters and, and musicians uh like for for you and, and your contemporaries uh well i mean i can uh so i started out as a bass player and um i still do some bass playing but um i uh, shortly after neon rome broke up or even before that i started playing in other people's bands as, as a side person so um i've always said uh, you know, there was a period where I've always played with other people. I've always kind of in, been in a whole bunch of bands at the same time. So yeah. that by very nature, you know, you, um, you know, you, you, you play with other people. I mean, music is a very, um, 
It's very not, I mean, I guess that is competitive in some regards, but for the most part, everyone's sort of doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, I've always just had a lot of, I've, I've always been very busy. I've always uh, had my hands in a lot of things. So I guess with that comes uh, working with a lot of different people, getting mm -hmm. to know a lot of different people. And, um, you know, I like I used to play in Ron's Sexsmith's band for a few mm -hmm. years and I uh, played in Kip's band and all sorts of, you know, things like that. And um, so I don't know, it's just it's a natural camaraderie. It's like you work with people and, you know, music is a, um, you know, when you're playing in a band and it's ensemble playing, you, you know, you're playing together. Right? It's, it's a team sport. Uh, yeah. You have to, right, you, you know, you, you play together. You know, if you do this, someone else does that, another person that does does the other thing, you put it all together and it makes, you know, it, it makes a, you know, a, a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's, it's a very uh, collaborative uh, um, sort of pursuit anyway. And mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, like I say, I've always, I've always, uh, I've always worked a lot. I've always played in a lot of different bands, played with a lot of different people. So that's just a natural byproduct of it. As far as like choosing the, um, the songs to cover, that's just sort of sheer fandom on my part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just love this song. I think this is a great song. And, and I mean, I did, you know, I mean, I tried to, you know, it wasn't that hard. I mean, there was a lot of these songs that I knew I thought were great songs, but were not widely known by um, even, you know, by, by people. I mean, there are some more, uh, well-known names like Ron Saxsmith and, and Art Bergman, but uh, a lot of these, a lot of these people on here, and it's just, it's just cheer like, hey, that's a beautiful song, that's a great song, yeah. And I mean, that's just part of the folk tradition. That's just part of the art tradition. You, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, someone writes a song, someone else thinks it's great, so they they play that song, and then, you know, it it, it takes on a new life, and so, but that that was just strictly me just loving the, these particular songs and, and wanting to do them. Nice. That's great. That's great. I mean, it, talking about work with a, a number of people and you mentioned about bass. And again, we were joking earlier about me in my hotel room in Hamilton. And you mentioned Teenage Head earlier. Uh, I was watching a video with you playing, I think it was bass with Cheeto Chrome and uh, che Cheeto Chrome. Cheeto? Did I say Cheeto? <laughs> wow. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> Cheeto Chrome. And, uh, I know you had, I know you also played, I think Gordon Lewis was on that. Um, yeah, we oh, getting choked up here. Can you share a bit about Gordon, his importance? Oh, well. Everybody? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I don't think it could be under overstated just how important Gordon Lewis was and Teenage Head were to mm -hmm. All those first wave punk bands, you know, are really... Um, you know, they were their um, uh, pioneers, right? You know, there's a difference between pioneers and settlers. Pioneers mm -hmm. tend to, you know, cut the cut the way through the forest and or the jungle, and the settlers sort of come in afterwards. And and, um, and so it's a much much. So I, I have great reverence for for all the first wave bands, but Teenage Head for me specifically because. Like one of my very first bands was, you know, sitting in the basement learning teenage head songs, right? I mean, the drummer would be, we'd be at the stereo and kept moving the needle back, and I'd be there trying to figure out the chords, and the singer would be there trying to figure out the lyrics. Okay, can you put it back again? Can you put it back again? And and um, so yeah, playing with Gord was a great, great honor. And in fact, um, so I guess what you saw was uh, so I, I played a group called the Screwed. Which is uh, we're at just oh, yeah. a punk cover band. It's just a fun party band. Uh, it's Cleve Anderson, uh, myself, uh, Steve Koch used to play in the Demix and the Vile Tones, and mm -hmm. a guy named Steve Saint used to be in a band called the Sinisters. Um, that was about I don't know maybe I don't know fifteen or more years ago. We just thought oh, let's just put a band together to do all first wave punk songs, all the songs that really you know got us turned on you know, when we were when we were when we were younger. And, um, you know, we'll do faithful versions. We, we're not going to try to put our own stamp on it. Let's just play the songs that we know and love. And um, we, so we would, uh, we would back up Cheetah Chrome. We did a number of little tours here where Cheetah would come up here, uh, Cheetah Chrome from the Dead Boys. And mm -hmm. uh, we would be his backing band and we would do a bunch of Dead Boys songs and, and some related stuff like MC5 or whatnot. And, um, and then we would be would be his backing band, and that led to uh, 
um, whenever we would play a Hamilton show, uh, Gord would come up and because uh, Gord and Cheetah knew each other from you know the the, the first uh, first wave days of the mid seventies and and uh, you know Gord would usually sit in on a couple songs and and, and that so that's what you saw there. But we actually uh, Gord actually um, he he subbed in for our guitar player the Screws guitar player uh, Steve Koch one time because uh, well, a couple times he did but because Steve couldn't make it a gig we had this gig and so. Um, we rehearse in our drummer Cleve's uh, basement. And so uh, Gord drove in from Hamilton and I had this just wild, weird moment where I was like, okay, I'm in a basement. The drummer's <laughs> basement, doing teenage head songs. <laughs> like, like I did 30 years ago, except for this time it's with Gord Lewis. Right? <laughs> and it was That's just crazy. Like, right, so again, that's, uh, you know, big, my fandom. I, I mean, I love teenage head to this day. Mm. I, you know, I, I I, I still listen to them. I still think they're one of the greatest uh, bands this country's ever produced. And yep. uh, terribly, terribly sad. Um, uh, yeah. And for the way that that all, all went down. And I don't think that'll ever stop being, um, you know, something that mm -hmm. we just, yeah. Yep. Yep. Pause. I hear you. Thanks for that, John. Shut. Thanks for sharing those memories. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm wondering if you might be able to play a song for us. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Blue wine. I'm drinking blue wine ever since you left me. I'm drinking blue wine over you. I'm feeling empty and broken in two. You took me with you and sent me bird through. I took you for granted and you left me blue. Now my heart is swollen over you. Cause I'm drinking blue wine ever since you left me. Drinking blue wine ever since you said goodbye. I'm drinking blue wine ever since you did reject me. I'm drinking blue wine over you. Stay with me, darling, one more time. Give me one night, give me one day. He picked the place, I'll bring the wine. Don't you leave me here this way. Cause I'm drinking blue wine ever since he left me. I'm drinking blue wine ever since you. Say goodbye. I'm drinking blue wine. Ever since you did forget me, I'm drinking blue wine over you. Over you. John, we, we have a segment called Lost Venues. Yes. Um, I don't know whether it's the, you know, over time, venues are going to come and go. Uh, yeah. But it seems over the past few years, um, we, we seem to be losing more and more of these places. But um, I'm wondering if you can share a story of, uh, of a lost venue, uh, a place that doesn't exist anymore that you hold fond memories of and, and maybe a, a, a fun uh, or not so fun story from one of these places. <laughs> yeah, well, um, 
Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. I thought of Larry's Hideaway when you uh, you mentioned I, when you first mentioned this. I thought of Larry's Hideaway. Okay. Which was uh, um, uh, you know, like it was a, I mean, it was it was a music venue underneath a, a hotel, and uh, not the nicest hotel in town. Right? <laughs> no. Actually, they they ended up they, they, what I think that what finally had them close down. The official the official reason for closing it down was because it was a body house. Right, which are uh, oh, like B A W, uh, oh. D Y, right? Yeah, and um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, you know prostitution and, and drugs and you know whatever like, going on there to the point where I remember um, you couldn't even get a cab to stop in front of Larry's Hideaway. You know, I remember thinking like you know half you know an hour ago, I was on stage, packed room full of people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> cheering at me you know telling me how great i am and now an hour later i can't even get a cab to stop for me out front I just, they literally sometimes sometimes they'd, they'd sort of drive in and then just like look like they were going to stop and then just keep going right? and um uh but one uh yeah so it, it, anyway so when you played there they would give you uh it was one of the rooms would be your dressing room Right, it was <laughs> the same one, but it was one of the <laughs> sort of the, uh, the hotel rooms would be your dressing room, and um, you know there's like cockroaches, and you'd hear all sorts of weird sounds, um, you know various various types of sounds. But one time we were sitting in there uh, between the sound check and our stage, and we heard a, the sound of a baby crying, like not in oh. not, not in distress, like it was being beaten or anything, but just the sound of a child crying like an infant crying in that environment like literally made the the hairs on the back of our necks stand up the whole room just sort of went silent and you know it was one of those places where no child should be in that place it didn't sound like they were being abused or anything but just the fact that there was there was a baby you know in this you know den of iniquity was uh was chilling oh my wow God. yeah it's uh it, 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 I've, I've often told the story where to me, we were in our change room and this guy gets up, the door opens, this guy comes out in his underwear, scratching his balls, walks to the washroom on the other side, takes a piss and goes back. And we realize our change room is literally his, uh, his apartment or whatever it was, hotel room in, <laughs> in at Larry's, right? It's like, anyway, right, that right. story you shared, that story you shared, that just, <laughs> that, that just took it up a whole other level. Cause it's like, you, 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 if you didn't live it, you would not believe, right? What went down yeah. at Larry's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So on the flip side of it, I'd love to, I mean, I know you just did, um, I think you just did a gig at Sellers and Newell's. Is that? Yeah. Just yeah, the other yeah. day. Um, what I find really interesting, I'd love to get your, your, your thoughts on is, you know, as much as we're losing venues, we have these sort of new types of venues, if you will, like, so yeah. there's Newell's and, you know, even Cops, which is a record store out in, I mean, they've got a couple, but the one in the Schwa that I know Will's running out in Oshawa, you know, you're starting to see this sort of, um, not, I don't know, not not makeshift, not underground, but sort of these these venues that weren't necessarily, wouldn't have necessarily been venues before, but they are yeah. now. I'd love to get your view on sort of that sort of new well, new type of establishment. Um, well, first of all, uh, the, the show we, we did at Sellers and Newell's, a small little bookstore in uh, on College mm -hmm. Street in Toronto. And um, the guy uh, who owns it, Peter Sellers, has been, um, he's been doing shows there for several years. I think since yeah. 2015, he does these uh, anything but poetry readings, funnily enough. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I actually had a show set up with them for May 2020, but of course that got canceled because of the pandemic. Um and we were talking about rescheduling it, but uh, Gary Top, who was one half of the great, uh, you know, the Gary, the promoters brought every great show uh, to town between you know the mid seventies to whenever they they stopped doing it. You know, every, every great show I saw was was a Gary show. Um, I've known Gary for years, and he pulled me up and said that. Uh, you know he's not doing any. Uh, he's not. You know he's not promoting as much stuff, and he he only wants to do shows that. Uh, at this place, uh, Sellers and Newell's. It's just, it's just super intimate and it's a really neat 
sort of um i think that we sold it out it was sold out i think that was like 35 tickets or something like that and that, and everyone was pretty crammed in there and um so yeah it, it was really yeah very cool um i you know it's funny um yeah i do like these these sort of alternative uh venues if you will mm -hmm. uh but when i first started and i'm sure you'll remember this too there was lots of uh you know, there was a like last call in Toronto was one o'clock, and so there was this whole um, speakeasy, uh, you know, after hours culture that yeah. would happen. It was going on like literally. I, I, I um, and so it played a lot of places like that. You know, warehouse spaces where um, uh, you know people live there, but you know, once a month they they have a party and they have some bands, or there may be an art show, or you know, sort of different. Uh, there was a lot of those, again, that sort of underground, you know, uh, everything was literally kind of underground. It was off the beaten track. You know, it's even some of the venues that we'd play, like all, I did so many booze cans. I went to so many booze cans, right, uh, where there was there was music going on and, and they were all, uh, you know, illegal and you had to... Uh, you know, some places would either have like, you know, they would have the bar in the, in the freight elevator. So if the cops came, they could just lower the freight elevator down to the next floor and get rid of all the booze. And there was always that threat of the cops showing up and, and closing it down. And and they were always in some sort of dark part of town, you know, where you had to sort of, you know, not literally know the password, but uh, you know, close enough to, yeah. uh, you know, like knocking on the door and the, the thing, the little shutter goes across. And, um so I mean, it does, yeah. So th that that sort of thing that we're seeing, these sort of pop up uh, things, it does remind me of that a bit. And um, yeah, I, I like to I like to see that. I think it's great. Yeah, that's cool. It's funny even you talking about that. I thought, I was thinking of back when like Queen West of Bathurst was way out there. Yeah, yeah. I, know. <laughs> I know it's hard to, to, to yeah Queen Street that Queen and Spadina <laughs> at one o'clock in the morning was was Deadsville. I mean it was like tumbleweeds going down the walk you know like going down the street. There was no uh, you know there was only a few bars on there. There was no other type of uh, there was not cars and, and lights and and places open I mean, it, it was really desolate on there yeah, yeah absolutely um so john one of the questions i'd like to ask before we wrap things up is um what are you listening to lately and whether it's new or old what are you listening to lately that people should be checking out um well you know i've been sort of listening to a lot of um i don't know older stuff lately i've been um uh what have i been listening to lately i guess uh one thing I discovered recently, this is 30 years old, but uh, is that group Massey Star. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I'm digging them. Throughout most of the 90s, I was really, um, um, you know, that's where I was really doing it, discovering, um, you know, roots music. It was around the like, early 90s when I first started writing lyrics and all that. So I started really getting into, you know, Hank Williams and, and um, you know, um, just that whole, the Carter family and the sort of the, the roots, uh, a lot of old blues and, and things like that. So I was really listening to tons of that stuff and not really keeping up on a lot of uh, the current music that was, that was out at the time. So I missed a bunch of bands and Mazzy Star is one of them. And I think they're great and really digging them. Um, what else have I been listening to? Uh, you know, I, I bought the new, um, you know, the Bob Dylan's latest uh, um, basement, uh, sorry, bootleg series, which was uh, on his uh, Time Out of Mind record. So there's an alternative mix in that, a bunch of different uh, outtakes and things like that. Um, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, rediscovering some stuff like, uh, you know, I have this little, I, I do sound, uh, I like the new Sadie's record. I've been loving the new Sadie's mm -hmm. record. I listen to that a lot. Um, I have this little music. Play. I do sound at uh, you know I work as a sound person as well, live sound person at Larry, I, at Larry's, at uh, the Horseshoe and and Lee's, and and I have this oh. little this little player that I have music on. So I've been sort of populating that with a bunch of stuff that I I, I used to listen to on vinyl, and so I'm just going to the iTunes store and and buying some of that stuff. So you know revisiting some like Patty Smith and the MC5 and some of my dear old you know favorite stuff nice that's great that's great and uh by the way just before we wrap up i want to you know do, i do want to thank you for the song trigger um change of heart oh. i just want to just want to throw that out amazing tune i was 
I was out of the scene by that point, but, uh, but, uh, you know, starting, I think I was starting to have kids at that point, but, uh, just amazing. I mean, thank you. Well, thanks. That was, that was a great period of my life playing with, with those guys, you know, I went back a long way with Ian and, and, um, you know, we had a lot of, I'm very, very proud of that record that, uh, yeah. tell me about the record and, we had some pretty uh, pretty memorable um, times when I was in that band. Awesome. Great great. Awesome. Thank you. John, thanks so much for your time. Mm -hmm. uh, before we let you go, um, if people want to download uh, your, your newest stuff, uh, access it, find out more about what you're up to, where, where can they go? Where should they go? Uh, well, they can always go to uh, johnbora.com my website and that's got links to all the stuff but uh yeah i'm on all the uh you know the streaming platforms um uh, you know spotify and whatnot or if you want to buy uh actually buy the music you can go to Bandcamp. there's uh you know you can order uh you know physical copies or you can also buy digital uh downloads and um yeah my uh the record i put out in 2020 was uh is a vinyl release so that's in a few record stores around town um uh, uh, rotate this grasshopper records um Ford cummings got it at his shop out on um uh, ronsonsville there that is Great. awesome okay uh any and show about my shows you can always uh, yeah get, always get my uh, music at my shows and you're still doing the weekly sunday matinees are you yeah every yeah. sunday at the the communist daughter with, with uh, yep. sam ferrara otherwise known as uh, screaming sam um he's a first wave uh, punk guy vile tones and the ugly um him and i have been playing together we've been doing that sunday matinee uh for almost 19 years wow every sunday from five to late and uh, we've been having a guest do the middle spot uh, pretty much every week these days so uh, it's not just us playing but um you know there's some always some it's a curated in the sense i you know i, I only uh generally book people that i know and that i like and i think you know are good and so that is cool. That's great. So that's the communist daughter from 5 p.m. till 8 p.m. Yeah, every Sunday. And then Sunday. I, I have a residency at the Cameron with my band on the first Saturday of every month from 6 till 8. And that's in the front room of the Cameron. All right. Various Perfect. other things around. Good awesome. stuff. It's great Great to see you're active as well. Uh, well still, you. yeah. still playing live. You know, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's one thing that uh, uh, that's amazing. So, mm -hmm. so, so thank, thank you for the live music. Oh, my pleasure. Well, thanks for helping. Thanks for your end. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Thanks, John. My pleasure.